On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar titled, How to Use Data to Impact Patient Safety. My name is Kathy Reynolds, and I'll be your moderator for this program. Now I'd like to, to introduce our speaker for the webinar, Chris Mamrell. Chris is a patient safety liaison with the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority for the South, Southeast region of Pennsylvania. Chris offers an extensive and well-rounded patient safety background to his facility. With his experience in behavioral health field, specializing in quality improvement, data management, and facility-wide safety, Chris brings a distinct skill set and viewpoint to the authority. Prior to joining the authority, Chris worked at Montgomery County Emergency Services, Inc., serving in multiple roles, including as a psychiatric technician, registered nurse, risk manager slash patient safety officer, performance improvement director, and most recently, managing multiple departments as the safety and quality systems director. Chris, I will now turn the program over to you. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you everybody for attending today's webinar. Uh, it will be on how to use data uh, to impact patient safety. And I want to basically, as we, we go through the objectives here, if I can get them to show up, there we go. Uh, I, I want to talk about how data can really impact patient safety, how you can use that data to make a patient safety case and, and really drive improvements, those kinds of things. So we'll talk a little bit about some data collection and measurement concepts. Very basic, I'm not going to get too in depth. We're not going to discuss uh, statistics too much. Um, you know, I know most people's eyes glaze over, and, and I worry about that when I can't see the audience of, of how many of you have fallen asleep. So the goal today, I guess objective four, will be everyone stays awake through the duration of the presentation. Uh, and then we'll go over some, some various tools, charts, graphs, those kinds of things of, of what you can use to analyze the data you're getting so you know what exactly it's showing you, and then how you can use that to, to show other people what you've got. Um, and, and what you want to prove or, or persuade them with that data. So why do we measure? We, we want to see what's going on. We want to see how our performance is compared to, to other units, to other facilities. It, it gives us an opportunity to really define where our problems are. What processes do we need to look at? What processes do we need to, to improve or change in some way? And we want to look for opportunities where we can, where we can make those improvements. Um, what do we expect from those improvements? How big of a, of a change do we want? Why is it important that we change these things? Uh, what's not on the slide here, but you know, we, we, we measure because regulatory agencies tell us to. Uh, you know, MCARE, we have to measure patient safety according to Act 13. So there's, there's things there. Joint Commission requires uh, measurements for accreditation, AAAHC. Um, you know, all, all your different CMS is, is requiring you to collect data and look at data for different core measures, things like that. Um, you have to look at data for Sentinel events. Um, it's, you know, it's, it, it really gives us a good picture of what's going on in our, in our facilities. So, aside from those regulatory, those outside measures, what are the internal drivers? We want to look at what, how our performance is. Um, you can see those corporate to performance assessment. This can be on a unit level, on a hospital level, a facility level. It can be individual level. This could be something you're using to, to credential your employees, to, to check the competencies of your employees. Uh, but mainly you're looking at systems. Um, how is it impacting you financially? How is it impacting your performance, your error rates, those kinds of things? Um, obviously, there's a big financial uh, component to that, so you might have some um, measurement requirements for managed care organizations, insurance companies, those kinds of things. And then from a risk management standpoint, uh, my, my, the way I kind of eased into patient safety was through risk management. And, and there's a lot there that you want to, you, you really want to make sure that you're minimizing the risk and, and doing the best you can to prevent those bad outcomes. And data helps you do that and helps you identify where you really need to do that and where some of your biggest risk areas are. So I'll, I'll get into, this is types of measurement, it's really types of data. Uh, the two big ones, the two big buckets, quantitative data and qualitative data. I'm sure you've heard these terms before. Um, I know a lot of people get them confused. What always helped me is when we're talking about quantitative data, it has that N in there, N for numbers. That's how I remember it. So really when you have quantitative data, you're looking at um, something that's measurable with a, with a number. So your, your rates, your frequencies, time is a big one. Um, temperature, you can see cost, ages, those kinds of things. 
When we get into qualitative data, this is a, a, a little bit harder, definitely harder to collect um, and, and a little bit harder to interpret sometimes. It's, it's observed but not measured in, in numbers, not measured in, in units of any type. So your, your satisfaction uh, surveys, those kinds of things. Um, if you wanna say that we're getting to people in a, in a timely manner, you we're reporting events in a timely manner, we're completing this process um, you know, you're, you're going to get things that are, that are more subjective, that are going to be written out in words as opposed to expressed in a number format. Most of what we're going to talk about today is, is going to be quantitative because most of your data is going to be quantitative uh, that you're going to be collecting. Um, really, there's, there's a, a theory behind it that if you have qualitative data, as long as you get a sample size big enough, eventually everything's going to be quantitatable. Um, you, you want to get those numbers so you can set your benchmarks and improvements and, and, and things like that. And I'll go into that as we go through. So how do we measure patient safety? Um, really, do, do staff report near, near miss events? Do they understand the reporting? You can, uh, you know, uh, the ARC culture Serve safety survey, uh, if you're not familiar with that, I encourage you strongly to look into that. It's available for free for a wide range of, of different facility types, and then they'll, they'll actually analyze it and benchmark it for you. Um, so, so start with the ARC culture of safety survey. You'll see if there's that fear of reporting. Is, are they scared of retribution? Uh, are they reporting those near miss events? Do they feel that their teamwork's going on? Do staff feel that, that patient safety is a, is a priority? That's really what you wanna look at when you're trying to judge overall your patient safety culture. As far as metrics, you can see on the right there, um, we wanna look at event types mostly. Uh, those are some common, these are probably the most common is that we're looking at medication errors, falls, errors, complications from procedures, pressure injuries, different transfers. Maybe we're looking at cancellations, those kinds of things. This is, these are the things that are most frequently um, looked at in patient safety. Coincidentally, we also have a lot of analytical tools available within the PACER system. Uh, PA PACER system has uh, some good analytical tools to get you started looking at some of those event types. So if you don't have any systems in place, if you're not already monitoring things, that's probably a good place to start to see, hey, can we use this information to evaluate how we're doing? And if not, it at least gives you a jump start on some ideas of how you can progress. Some other things you're, you're probably looking at already, um, HAIs are big, you know, your, your CLABI and your CAUDIs, um, any other HACs. Um, so it, it, it's really, you want to look at the big things that are impacting, impacting you, okay? So as far as types of measurements, I'm going to define them into three big buckets. So your outcome measures, your outcome measures are going to tell you whether your changes are actually leading to an improvement. Basically, overall, are we improving patient safety? So you might have, uh, you see there, there was a, a, the adverse drug events per thousand doses, or you can say, what are our surgical site infections per number of cases, those kinds of things. So these are gonna be your outcomes. What happens at the end? What is coming about from all the changes you've made? Process measures are going to be when you're looking at changes you're making to core processes. Uh, are we seeing changes further upstream um, if you want to think of it upstream versus downstream, this is going to be, okay, how many are, are you can see the example there, a percentage of staff reporting a patient safety climate. Uh, this might be a pharmacy interventions per 1,000 emissions, 1,000 patient days or 100 emissions, something along those lines. Uh, you could look at percentage of surgical, surgical cases with on-time prophylactic antibiotic administration. So that's a process that is going to probably affect your number of cases of that result in a surgical site infection. Balancing measures. So we, we want to improve these outcome measures. We've looked at process measures. Balancing measures is our opportunity to say, okay, we've made changes to try and make an improvement to a process. Is that creating a new problem elsewhere? Okay, so we might want to have patients check their own medications, but is that going to lead to a decrease in, in patient satisfaction? If we're focusing on appropriate administration of those prophylactic antibiotics, are we seeing an increase in, in the number of resistant bacterial strains that we're, we're seeing? So this is really to make sure that, okay, am I creating another, am, make sure I'm not creating another problem by trying to solve one. That's the three types. 
Uh, you'll probably have more process measures than outcome measures. Most people focus on those outcome measures, but it's really important to look further at those process measures and balancing measures to make sure that the changes you're making are actually what's affecting your outcome measures and it's not something unrelated or that you're not aware of. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can show data. Uh, numerator, denominator, taking everybody back to, to math class. Uh, I'm sure everybody loves that. Uh, if you remember, numerator's on top, your denominator's on the bottom. So your numerator is going to be what you're measuring really is, is, is what's reported, what's observed, your number of falls, the number of medication errors, the number of surgical site infections, the number of on-time prophylactic antibiotic administration, those things. Your denominator, avoid assuming what your denominator is and assuming that everybody knows what your denominator is. Even as we look at the examples there, patient days, doses administered, surgical procedures, central line days, you really need a good, um, we'll call it a data dictionary to consistently define your data. So are we gonna look at the number of falls per patient days? Well, if we're looking at the number of falls, are we looking at just the number of patient falls? Are we including staff falls in there? If so, we might want to reevaluate what we're using as a denominator. Maybe we want to use a time period. Maybe we want to use number of patients and staff on site for, for a given uh, period, something along those lines. So you want to make sure that you're actually getting a number that's, that's meaningful. Um, so again, don't just assume that denominator, define it and define it very well so you're sure that you're, you're getting um, accurate information. So if we want to look at canceled procedures per surgical procedures, are we looking at surgical procedures that are scheduled for the day or surgical procedures per doctor, those kinds of things. Um, again, if we're looking at falls, do we want to exclude anybody, identify any exclusions? If we're excluding behavioral health patients, if we're excluding those visitors, if we're excluding staff members, just have that well-defined so your entire team knows the meaning of the data that they're looking at. This will also help you when you're doing sampling. Um, Really, sampling is important most of the time, and we'll talk about ways of gathering the measures, but most of the time you're, you're going to have problems getting 100% of, of, your, of your denominator measured. So you're going to have to sample. So when you look at your denominator, in, include what that sample is. Um, as far as how much you need to sample, there's, there's guidelines about, uh, out there, usually through your, your regulatory and accrediting agencies. Um, based on the, the number of events, the number of patients you have, they might require 50 charts be reviewed or 30%, something along those lines. The other important thing with, with sampling is you want to make sure you're getting a random sample. You just don't want to grab the, you know, the first five cases of each day or the five, last five cases of each day. You want to be as random as possible, and that's going to give you the best, um, the best breakdown and the best representation within your sample of the population as a whole. And again, I'll touch base on that a little bit. Um, later as far as, as, as good sampling and, and, and how that can impact the results of your data. Numerators and denominators are going to give you a rate. This is going to enable you to compare over time, um, month to month, other units, those kinds of things. If you're measuring just your raw data, you might get, oh, well, we had three falls this month and five falls the next month where we got two falls worse. Uh, but if you had double the amount of patient days in that second month, it's obviously better with your rate. So you always want to look at number of falls over patient days or number of falls over, you know, uh, some other representation, 100 admissions, those kinds of things, um, depending what kind of facility you are and what kind of patient population you're looking at. You also want to benchmark. Uh, there's, there's tons of benchmarks out there. Uh, I'll talk about those in a little bit. And then there's, there's abilities to benchmark internally and set goals internally that way. So when you look at rates, this gives you a good way to, to show an improvement. This is just a quick example. So if I have a, a quarter one fall rate of 4.6 and a quarter two fall rate of 3.2, I'm going to subtract them. You're going to take that difference divided by the, the larger number or the first number and, and get your percentage of improvement. That confuses some people. You know, if, if, if we start with two and we have one, are we saying that there's 100% improvement, 50% improvement, those kinds of things. So again, just be consistent and make sure that what you're saying number-wise is accurately um, communicating what you're, you're experiencing. Benchmarking. This is a huge thing. This is, we get so many questions at the authority about benchmarking 
what benchmarks to use, how do we use those benchmarks, where can we get benchmarks for this, that, and the other. Um, there's, there's lots of places out there that you can get benchmarks from. Benchmarking is basically comparing yourself to either someone else or yourself internally. Um, so I'll, I'll really I explain internal versus external. Uh, external, you're going to be looking at um, maybe some places for best practices. Um, you can look at places for uh, just to see how other facilities are performing. You can go through uh, NDNQI, um, the National Database of Nursing Quality Indicators. There's core measures available through your, your quality check sites through CMS. Uh, ARC has, has a ton of quality measures that you can look at. Um, different ASCs, uh, uh, organizations have so your you know your AAA HC has some some um, benchmarking data when you get to, to rehab the hospitals Carolina's rehabilitation has a program called Equator that provides some benchmarking there so there's always benchmark data available out there externally is that the best though sometimes it's not you have to be very careful that what you're comparing to your external benchmarks is exactly what's going on in your facility uh, are they doing the same types of procedures? Is it the same type of patient population? Uh, you know, coming from psych, are we looking at a behavioral health population? Are we looking at a, a geriatric behavioral health population? Those kinds of things. You need to make sure that you're really comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges, apples to tomatoes, those kinds of things. That's where internal benchmarking can be very useful. Internal benchmarking is basically you're comparing yourself to yourself, whether that's unit to unit, whether that's provider to provider, whether it's, it's yourself and in, in, in historically to yourself now, currently. This is, you have a lot more control. You know a lot more information about what's there. Um, what was the, the patient population? How do, well does it match up to your patient population? What does their environment look like? Um, you know, are they using the same kind of equipment? These are things that you can't always match with external benchmarks, so it can be difficult. Um, that, that's really the big advantage of internal. So we, we at the authority, myself, I, we're, we're pushing internal. That's, that's where you can get a lot of really good valid comparisons to, to go through. Because um, you want to avoid those, uh, and you'll see the benefits and pitfalls. I, I think the benefits are obvious is when we're talking about comparing and, and aiming for a goal, especially with best practices. And the pitfalls is, is if you're not comparing to the right thing there. Other thing to consider with external benchmarks is, is we're probably pretty well siloed in, in healthcare. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Uh, I have some examples later in this program. I'll talk about ED wait times and, and things like that. So yes, you can, you can benchmark between maybe some other EDs within your health system as an internal benchmark. You can measure against your, your previous year's numbers as a benchmark. You can look at other hospitals, other the literature that's out there about uh, ED wait times. Also, think outside the box. If you're really not um, coming up with some good ideas, you can, you can go that innovation route and say, okay, well, let's look at check-in wait times for a hotel chain. Maybe that's a way we compare ourselves that, okay, they're, they're really focused on customer satisfaction. We want to focus on customer satisfaction, get those numbers up. Let's compare ourselves to how those, those hotel chains are doing. Um, so there's, there's always somewhere to look for your benchmarking. I know this is a struggle. Everyone's always like, well, where do we get our benchmarks? Where do we get our benchmarks? So to make sure you're expanding your search and really looking in, in places that might not be uh, obvious up front. So we know what we want to data, what we want to measure. We know what we want to compare. How are we going to get that information? If you have a, a, an EHR, I know there are a lot of headaches for a lot of things. They make data collection really, really easy. So if you can talk to your, your IT staff and get that information, please do it. Um, you'll, you'll be able to grab a larger sample set. You can sometimes get 100% of your sample size, 100% uh, sample size, which is great. That's really what you want to be because you're not going to miss out on anybody. You don't have to worry, is my sample really randomized, those kinds of things. There's, there's ways to have abstraction and, and, and different, um, your dispensing cabinets, your pumps, those kinds of things. You can pull data from. So make sure you're talking to your, your biomed people, your IT people, to get as much good data as you can. As far as if you can't do it electronically, uh, pull from your quality and PI numbers. Pull from your peer review process. Have a tool that you can monitor. Is, is there a falls audit tool? Um, we have some available through the authority. We also have some great wrong site surgery observation tools. There, there's tons of stuff coming out as far as monitoring 
um, different types of events. But be sure that you know exactly what type of event you want to look at. Um, if you're looking at, you know, improving your, your surgical time for ortho procedures, don't get a tool that's going to monitor all your procedures. Don't pull out all of your procedures. Again, be very clear of what your denominator is. Make sure you're making that very clear to your IT staff. A lot of times those people don't have much clinical experience, if any, so you really need to be very careful how you define that denominator because they're going to be thinking in, in, in terms of coding and, and um, numbers and tables and, and things like that. So very important, always, 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 always know what you want to be monitoring up front, and that'll make it much easier for you to communicate that to, to other team members. I'm not going to go too much into this uh, as far as data validity and data reliability. Um, where this really comes into play is if you're using different quanti qualitative tools, um, if you want to measure uh, suicide risk is a big thing that comes up and, and the, the validity and reliability of those tools is, is really important. When we talk about validity, um, are you getting what you really want to measure? So this is important when you're talking to that IT, IT staff, you're pulling it out. Uh, when you're looking at medication errors, are you pulling out adverse drug reactions? That doesn't necessarily mean there was an error. That's going to give you invalid uh, information. Um, what kind of variability in your inputs are you getting? Are you collecting all that information properly? Are you looking at the right population of patients? All important considerations. Again, talk to your data people. They can get you a little bit more into this. I'm not going to go too much into validity. Reliability is basically, is this indicative of, of our patients? Is this sample that we've chosen appropriate and representative? Um, you know, we're not just picking the, the first five people that come in. We're not just picking the, the five people with the longest procedures and looking for errors. We're not looking for, you know, improvements with the people that have the most medications, those kinds of things, unless we've decided that's our larger population. Once you've decided your larger population, make sure that you're pulling out a sample that's indicative of that. And there's ways to test that that I'll go into a little bit later. So we know what we're going to measure. We know how we're going to measure it. What do we do when we get all that stuff? We're, we're going to aggregate it. We're going to bring it all together. We're going to include it. How do we analyze it and display it? There's tons of charts out there, histograms, run charts, control charts, radar charts, scatter charts. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples of those. We're going to go through some of them. Some are good for analyzing your data. Some are good for showing your data. Know what you're using it for. Um, obviously, you're going to want to analyze your data before you're trying to make a point or, or persuade your senior leadership, for example. Um, but you want to look at baseline data, decide what changes you're going to make, and then really analyze how your changes are impacting your data. Then put it into a format that you can communicate that easily to someone. We'll talk a little bit about continuous monitoring at the end as well. It's a very important tool. So what's out there to help you? Spreadsheets, Excel being the most common. Um, Excel has, has really stepped up their data game in, in recent iterations. Uh, a lot, they've recommended charts uh, that'll show you your data in a, in a way that, that might be exactly what you're looking for. It might not. Always be a little cautious of what Excel is showing you. Um, but there's plugins available that'll give you a good statistical breakdown of, of a lot of your data in Excel. I already mentioned Pacers, uh, some good analytical tools there. Uh, you can get data from your own facility. A lot of times there's ability to compare to statewide data. Reach out to your patient safety liaison if you're looking for some type of comparison statewide. Uh, and we're more than happy to do that. You can also take your Pacers data and export it to Excel and then uh, manipulate it there. So there's, there's definitely some different uh, opportunities. There's also programs like Minitab, um, the, the PSN, RL has, QI has these, all these different risk management programs, software, uh, analytics software is, are available to really improve um, your representation, your analysis, those kinds of things. So some of these are going to be good for looking at and, and determining how your analysis is going. Some are going to be good for your reports, for taking to your leadership, to your board, those kinds of things. So when you do that analysis, you want to look for your patterns, your trends, uh, correlation. I'll talk a little bit about correlation. Again, correlation is not necessarily um, causation. Uh, you want to see a relationship. That's going to be your correlation. How are these things related to each other? Is it special versus common cause? Well, I'll talk about that when we get to control charts and those kinds of things. So when you look at your data, you don't want to look at it and say, okay, we're, we've seen an increase. We're going to keep doing what we're doing after one month. 
you want to get as many data points as you can to really make an adjustment. There's, there's a, a very common mistake people make, more so in manufacturing, uh, of, of readjusting too soon. So when they see a process starting to slip in one direction, they'll, they'll say, oh, we have a trend, let's make an adjustment back the other way. Well, there's, there's pretty clear definitions of what an actual trend is, and you don't want to make a reaction too soon because you, you can actually end up with a process that's more out of control than if you just let it kind of evolve over time and, and, and check less frequently. So it's, it's important, don't, don't be checking in and, and drawing conclusions too soon. Don't draw conclusions that the data is not really showing you as far as correlation and causation. So when, when you're looking at, um, let's say we're, we're looking at data for medication errors, quarter one to quarter two. If we're looking at a static point of view, we can say, okay, are these, are these two numbers different? Why are they different? That's not going to be, it'll tell us whether we have more in one quarter or the other. That's not gonna give us really a lot of data over how our process is working or if we've made changes and how that's having an effect. Because we know everything that we do, if we do the same procedure 100 times, it's not going to, to result in the, the same amount of surgical time each one. Uh, commute, your commute to work. You probably take the same route to work every day or almost every day. Are you, does it take the exact same amount of time every day? No, there's always going to be some set variation in there. What we look at data to determine is, okay, is this within control limits? Is this normal expected variation in our process? Or is there some type of special cause variation? Is there uh, an accident? Is there inclement weather? Something that's going to really throw it out of whack. Now we're getting to the fun stuff, the charts and the graphs and things like that. And it's relatively fun. I know that, that data can be a little bit boring, but we're gonna try and spice it up a little bit here. Um, so when you're picking a chart, it's, it's important. You wanna look at, okay, what am I comparing? Um, am, am I comparing over time? Am I comparing among different items, different units? How many different uh, time periods am I looking at? How many different variables am I looking at between my, my different um, items? What's the relationship between those? Am I, am I looking for some type of, of correlation between two or three variables? How am I looking at the distribution? And I'll talk a little bit about normal distribution and, and, and different types of, of um, modal distribution, things like that. Uh, am I looking at a single variable, multiple variables? Uh, am, am I looking at a, a few data points, multiple data points? And then composition, am I looking at something that, that's static? Is this something that, okay, we did a survey, here's our results, how do I wanna show that? Or am I saying, okay, we've, we've checked in at multiple points over time, how do I wanna show that? This is a tool, I hope you can see this on your screen. Um, this is pretty good, it's available from extremepresentation.com. Um, it's basically just a quick reference. Okay, how do I want to? How do I want to? What kind of data might have? What kind of data do I do I want to display? And what's the best way to do this? Okay. So I have data. I, I became a father five years ago, and again about two years ago. Um, so this is just a simple chart showing you the real benefits of fatherhood. A pie chart. What does the pie chart show you? We, we know if we look at this, okay, I wanna see composition. I wanna see composition of, and I'm gonna try and work this here, I want composition. I want composition of a single, simple share of a total of, of one static set of information. So pie chart, is this going to be a good representation of, of what I'm looking at here? These are the benefits, it's one time period, it's right now. One person answering, uh, I want to raise a child with good morals, good values, that, that behaves well. Um, but really, we have a big band of Legos that I've had since I was a kid, and now I can play with them again. And that's huge. So this is, this is showing really that breakdown of, okay, we know what's really important in fatherhood. Why do staff come to an in-service? Why do they uh, attend a training? Valuable information? Yes. Is it applicable to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis? Yes. Are there CEs available? I need to get my CEs in. Are they, that, that's a bigger slice. But really, free food, that's huge. So this is a, a, a little breakdown. Is this the best way to display this data? Again, we're looking at a static point. Um, it, it's a good graphical representation. There's other ways to display it. Let's say we wanted to do a scatter plot of this. Is this a good representation? Probably not. 
it's a little hard to tell. If we take that and put it into a bar graph, a column chart, this is a, a little bit better. I can see the relative importance of that free food to CEs. This is something that, uh, uh, again, the whole picture is worth a thousand words. It's really true. I look at this and I can tell that right away, oh, okay, if we want people to come, we need to give them free food and probably CE. So it's a, a little bit of an example. I'll get into some specific chart types now. Uh, probably the most common that you'll see. I'm sure everybody's seen a run chart. Um, this is a run chart of, of deaths reported by acute care facilities. Um, from 2005 to 2018, it was a, it's available in our 2018 annual report, which you have not seen, is available on the Patient Safety Authority website. A uh, little plug there, there's some great charts and graphs in here. I have a couple of examples, but there's many, many more. So really, what does a run chart give you? This is going to let you look at something for a trend or pattern over time, okay? It's something that's occurring in, in, a, in an order. In a, in a set order, usually over time, um, and it's going to make it very easy for communicating and understanding your variation and, and to see where you're heading in there. You can see that this one has a, has a trend line. That dotted line is a trend line included to show you that overall this, this is trending down. Very simple. I think most people can look at this and really tell that, oh, okay, that's, these numbers of deaths are going down. So this is a good chart to choose to communicate that, that information is as easily and as simply as possible, okay? You can use this if you're looking for, okay, we wanna show everybody how we're doing with this. This is great. You can show it, if, if we have a point, let's say in 2012 where we made a change, I can add a little call out that said, okay, in 2012 we made this change and show how that affected um, the, 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 the results of this process. Uh, you can show that, okay, we've, we've made a change and we're able to sustain that downward that downward trend. Um, this is something that when we get into that monitoring, that continuous monitoring, that quality assurance that it, it's important to see. When you make a one chart, again, you wanna make sure that you're, you're very clear on the process you're measuring. Um, you can collect the data and you're gonna create a, a, a graph with just a single vertical line there between your different po uh, data points. Again, Excel, very easy. You just basically going to need to define what your X axis, what your Y axis, um, and go through, and it's a very easy chart to interpret, but don't jump to conclusions. If you're using a term, make sure you know what it is. So, four things to be aware of. Uh, a shift. Your shift, you're gonna see at six or more consecutive points that are either uh, all above or below the median. You can see the median is, is your middle point is charted on, on all of these. Um, any value that falls on your median doesn't count. You can skip those. Um, Really, when you get to those six values on, on, on one side and you have a shift, that's, that's going to affect the probability of, of what you're going to see next. Similarly, a trend. A trend is going to be uh, five or more points going either all up or all down. It doesn't matter whether they're crossing the median or not. Um, again, you can ignore some points. You can see uh, on this example here, there's two points right here that are equal. You can ignore those, those don't disqualify a, a, a trend. Um, you would just kind of skip over those like you would any point on the median in, in that shift determination. But really, a, a, we jump to conclusions a lot with trends. You know, we see two or three data points going up. We see one, you know, we make a change in the next month. We have a reduction in our errors and we say, oh, we're trending downward. No, you don't have enough data yet. So maybe you need to be collecting data a little bit more frequently. Maybe you need to be um, a little bit more patient in, in uh, deciding that you've done a good job. Next, we'll go to runs. Uh, runs, this is basically, um, if you don't have enough runs, you, you want at least two, uh, or we have a total of two here. The, a, a run is, um, you want crossings of the median line. Basically, you want your, your data to show that it's going up and down. Um, if it's not going up and down, that's not variability. It's not showing variability. Um, it, it's, you don't have, you have non-random data. So that's either showing that you're, you're having some result as a, as a change to a process, um, or you've, you've shifted um, your, your baseline, your control limits a little bit. This basically needs, means you need to look into it a little bit more, okay, what's going on with our data? The last one, the astronomical point, uh, outlier is probably the more common word for it. Um, 
it's 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 non probability based but really you're going to see either really large numbers or really small numbers um, when we get to control charts these will be things that will be outside of your your upper or lower limits um, I, I think it's pretty clear to anyone that when you look at that astronomical point chart that there's a point that's the uh, unusual right um, not just a high point and a low point but something that's really far out there and this is something that when you do a run chart you should be able to, to see graphically very easily very quickly it makes it really easy to identify okay what happened in, 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 in that time period that led to that outlier I mentioned control charts this is a good example again this is the example we use in our um, in our annual report. I think it's great because we all have a daily commute. We can all kind of see what this data means. So on a control chart, it's a type of run chart. We have our median, again, graphs there, our mean you can see. And then we have our upper and lower control limits. Our upper and lower control limits, I'm not going to go too big into, into Six Sigma. I'm a big Six Sigma guy. But basically, your upper and lower control limits are going to be set three standard deviations away from your your, your, your mean. Um, what that means is that almost 100%, 99.7% of your data points should fall between those control limits, will fall between those control limits. So when you have those points that are outside of your control limits, outside of your normal variation, you know that there's a special cause variation there. There's something that happened outside of the normal that caused that to happen, and that gives you an idea of where to start looking for your, your root causes and, and things that are affecting your process that are not part of the normal variation that you see. So it, with our commute, this could be something that maybe this was, a like I said, a, a traffic accident or inclement weather, blizzard, something along those lines. I, I, I mentioned variation. Really, you're going to see common cause, common cause variation you want. Um, this is something that it's, it's you're, you're going to see something that's in statistical control. If you want something in more control, you're, you're going to see your, your upper and lower control limits come closer together. Uh, if you want to make it more stable, and I'll talk a little bit about stability, but your common cause variations, that's always going to be there. There's no way I'm going to drive to work 20 days in a row and it have take the exact amount of time 20 days in a row. There's always going to be some type of variation in there. Um, common cause normal, special cause, that's going to be where we have our, our outliers. Something happened, um, why is it out of control? If, you're, if your process is out of control and there's common cause, you'll see that with more than one just outlier. Um, typically, a, a process that is out of control is going to be the result of, of a special cause. Mentioned your upper and lower control limits, those are your three standard deviations. Your mean is your average, your median is your middle number. Um, your mode is the number that occurs the most. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. We talked about what's in and out of control. And this is important. Before you begin making changes to a process, you want to make sure that it's in control. That's going to show you that, okay, everybody's following the same process. They're following the same rules. They're doing the steps in order. If you have a process that's out of control and you make changes to that process, you can't predict what your change is going to make, and you can't predict that what changes are come about as a, as a result of whatever action you took are a result of that action or just the process being out of control. So really it's important that when you're establishing your baseline data that you make sure that your processes are in control before you go making changes. So really, you got to clean up everything before, before you, you look to make improvements or identify where those opportunities might be. Uh, again, select the process. You're going to determine how you're going to sample and plan, collect your data. Um, again, Excel will do upper and lower control limits for you. You don't have to um, calculate them. Um, but really, you, you want to make sure that you're aware of what kind of data you're, you're plotting and if the control chart is, is appropriate. As far as the analysis, this chart's a little hard to read. You can see that the CL, that's the, the um, your your median in the or your mean in the middle there, um, and then your upper limit control limit and your lower control limit. So when you're looking and saying, okay, is the process in control, out of control? If something's falling out of the upper control limit or lower control limit, you know that it's out of control. There's other rules you can see in there saying that okay, we have eight points in a row in, in above the line. That's showing that our process is out of control, that we don't have the expected variability. These are just some general rules of thumb. Um, I believe these are Nelson rules. Uh, the, the stability 
Um, as you can see, we also call these charts Schuert charts. Uh, Schuert had a set of, I want to say it's 12 or 13 rules um, as far as when a process is in control or out of control. I'm not going to go into those too much, um, but you can see a, a breakdown of, of what you can look at for whether something's in control or out of control. Histograms. This is good if you have data that you've collected over a period of time and you want to look at it and say, okay, do we have normal distribution of this data? So um, this is, is times of, of door to ECG. So this is something that we've measured over maybe a month period. We have, let's say, 30, 40 data points. Where do we want to see it? How is it being um, distributed um, among there? We're looking for something. This is what's called a normal distribution when it comes out perfectly bell-shaped. This shows us that we don't have any special cause variation in there. This shows we can make a lot of assumption of that normal data, the uh, statistics based and things like that that I'm not going to get into. But this is basically showing us from our point that our, our process is centered. Our process is functioning as we expect it to be functioning wherever that time to, to first EKG is. This way we know that our process is in control. We can do something with it and, and, and modify it. Um, you might have something a little bit different if you're measuring uh, a different data set. So this is a, this is a normal distribution. You might have a, a bimodal distribution where there's two high points, where we have a, basically two bell curves right next to each other. You can have multimodal, multimodal, where you might have multiple uh, bell curves right next to each other. Basically, this is going to show that, okay, there's, there's two sets of common cause variation that are causing this. So if we're looking at surgical times and we have bimodal distribution, maybe we're looking at two different surgeons and they take different amounts of time. Um, so this is, if, if, again, if we go back to um, commute time. Commute time, we would expect to look like this. If we had bimodal commute times, maybe there's two different routes to work that I take. You know, or maybe one's our commute to work, maybe one's our commute home from work, if there's varying traffic, those kinds of things. So again, there's going to be a different set of of causal factors uh, if you see more than one high point, more than, more than one mode there. This is a breakdown of, of just some sample data of ED wait times over a month. So this very clearly, uh, perfectly normally distrib distributed. Sometimes you're going to have it skewed a little bit off to the left or right. Um, if, it's, if it's coming off to the, if it's higher on the left, you're going to have a positive skew, higher on the right, negative skew, depending what um, factor you're looking at. You can see the numbers down at the bottom here. This is the size of your bins. So each one of your columns is going to be a bin. There's um, six bins in this, and we can see, okay, so we have five minutes to 10 minutes in this one, 10 minutes to 16 minutes, 16 to 21 minutes. So your bins are going to be the same size, except for our above 32 minutes. This is going to capture some of our outliers that are probably above that upper control limit. Um, but again, as, as far as um, falling into the normal distribution, you can see this is still generally, we're getting a, a bell curve-like structure, maybe a little bit right skewed. So that's what you would determine from this is, okay, we're, we're pretty good with our ED wait times. Maybe this is something that we just want to skew down. Maybe we want to shift the whole thing to the left. Uh, and that's really where our, where our improvement efforts are going to be. So we might have, you know, if we have our median time that's here, we say, okay, this is our, this is our baseline. We want to shift this five minutes to the left. And then that's our goal. So that enables us. We can even show two histograms next to each other, uh, a breakdown to show, okay, this is where our histogram has shifted, showing our distribution of wait times. So we've really made an improvement or not. Pareto chart, this is basically to show the most important thing uh, among a typically large set of factors. This has five factors here. They're, they're typically larger. I, you know, we, we're using small examples just to kind of deliver. This line here is showing the percentage of total. So you can see it's going to start pretty high and jump up, and then the, the increases are going to get incrementally smaller as the impact uh, um, gets incrementally smaller. So really, this is something that we're going to take. Uh, and if we do a survey, if we pull our data, they might not be in this order, but by putting in this order with largest to smallest, we can see where do we want to focus first. So if you're looking to, to give baseline data and say, okay, where do we want to see our, our mean improvement efforts go, well, we want to look at um, 
why aren't meds being delivered on time? Let's look at the generic versus manufactured labels. Uh, are the drugs out of stock? Is there a drug shortage? Those kinds of things. So, you know, it, we might think that we uh, that cannot read order would be important, but once we get our data, we show this, it, it, it's pretty clear what the most important factor is. Very, very important. Again, you can show before and after in this, uh, in this type of, of chart. Um, it's good to say, okay, we focused a lot of our efforts on uh, the generic versus um, versus brand name. Here's the improvements. You can show a, you know, a, a revised chart, a revised bar maybe right next to it um, where we haven't made as much of an impact on some of the other categories, but really we see this decrease because this is where we focused our, our efforts. Good for analysis, yes. Very, very handy when we're talking about um, convincing, uh, making a business case, basically. Of, okay, this is why we want to focus on the tallest bar. We, this is why we want to focus on generic versus brand name medications, because we have the tallest bar there. It's the most important. And this is something you can show to your board. You can show to your administrative staff, your C-suite, and it's pretty clear this is why we want to show this, okay? It's also useful if, if these are different numbers, different, um, maybe different denominators, different rates, uh, if you want to compare different rates to show. So you might have um, error information versus cost information and, and kind of display that. So you can have a different measurement scale to show um, your, your different causes and you can still accurately display that. Back to our Y staff attendant in service. So we see. This is a little confusing here uh, as far as the breakdown of our, of our survey results. So the, the, the line graph is actually going on the, the data along the, the right side here. These numbers are, uh, I think, number of responses out of, out of 100 divided by 100 or something along those lines, whatever our measurement scale is. Um, but basically, again, you can see, okay, very easy to see where we want to focus if we want to get staff to attend and in service. Probably a little bit easier than that bar chart if we go back to. Again, when you get into large amounts of data, this is really important. We're looking at four different bins here. If we get up to, you know, 100 different factors, 200 different factors, highlighting those tallest ones up front is going to make it a lot easier to identify them, read them, to, to graphically show when you're presenting your information to someone else or on a dashboard. Radar charts, uh, sometimes called spider charts. Um, this is basically when you have multiple variables, you want to show multiple variables. I am not a big fan of these myself. I know some people that love them, that, that swear by them. Really the advantage here is you can see, okay, we set up our best practice measures on the outside. Here's our initial quarter, our most quarter. We can see where the biggest gaps are between us and where we want to be. Um, a lot of times you'll see this used to compare individuals to one another. Um, this comes, if anybody's, uh, you know, sports fans, a lot of times prospects draft prospects, uh, baseball prospects, football prospects, those kinds of things. A lot of times they'll show like, you know, speed, agility, uh, height, weight, those kinds of things broken out because they have so many variables. I can look at this and say, okay, prospect A has a, has a distribution like this, process B has a distribution like this, which one do we prefer for whatever system we're looking for? If we value speed more, we're obviously gonna go with, with our, our maroon, um, our maroon, prospect over our, our yellow prospect there, okay? So really your biggest, from a healthcare standpoint, your biggest gap is going to be your biggest priority when you're looking at that. Like I said, very, very useful comparing um, multiple variables, maybe measured for, for different items, different individuals, those kinds of things. Scatter diagram, um, this is when you're gonna talk about the relationship of causal, uh, uh, ah, caught myself, a correlation relationship in there. Um, we can make, some, some determinations of correlation from a scatter diagram. So when we look at um, a, a, a diagram here, uh, this is what's showing what's called a, a, a positive correlation. So we have, as we increase our x-axis, we see an increase in our y-axis, okay? If our slant was downward, we would have a negative correlation. This is just basically showing that, okay, there's a relationship between these two variables. You can determine that there's a relationship between these two variables because these things are following along a basic line. So we can kind of draw a line indicating where these fall, and most of these points are within, uh, within the, a, a certain area of the line here. The closer all these points get to the line, 
the strongest our, the stronger our correlation is. So if these are all grouped very closely in the middle, we, we know that there's a strong correlation, that our lapse time is affected by time of day very strongly. If these are spread out more, it's either a weaker correlation or maybe no correlation at all if we have points kind of scattered all over the place. Again, this does not mean causality. Just because two things are correlated doesn't mean that they, they cause one another. Um, the example I always like is that uh, the, number of the, the number of gallons of ice cream sold correlates very, very strongly, about a 98% correlation to number of shark attacks. Um, so yes, those things correlate to one another, but obviously buying ice cream isn't causing people to be attacked by sharks, unless sharks have a really strong inclination to eat ice cream that we might not be aware of. Um, but we know that they're correlated. Why are they correlated? Maybe there's a third factor in play. In this case, if we look at outside temperature, that correlates very strongly with ice cream sales and shark attacks because people are at the beach. So it, it'll give us an idea of, okay, what's the relating factor, something along those lines. But this is really if we want to see what we're doing, is it, is it having an impact? What is having an impact on our data? Um, again, this line, uh, the, this comparison line, it's, it's sometimes referred to as the fat pencil test. Basically, if you can lay down a fat pencil and cover up all the points, that's an awful pencil, um, then, then you have uh, a correlation with your data, okay? So we have our people waiting in the ED. How many people left without being seen from our ED? We have the number of patients that are getting treatment for a specific day, and then we have the number of people that left. You can see there's no real line in here. If we try and draw a line, even a fat pencil line, we're not gonna, we're not gonna see it. We're just going to have these points are too far away, um, so there, there's no correlation here. We can we can make that determination. Okay, also very useful to know. Statistically significant. Again, I'm not going to go too much into this, but basically there's a there's a p value related to every um, sample size that you take, and your p value is is going to be um, typically the one that's kind of the rule of thumb. Uh, is, is a uh, significant value of 0 0.05, basically 5%. So 5% of your data is, is going to be, um, it, it, less than 5% of your data is going to occur by chance. So if more than 5% of your data is, is, is falling outside of a, of a realm, then your whatever effect you're having is statistically significant. When I say significant, um, statistically significant is not significant like we think of it. It doesn't mean that it's important or meaningful. It just means that it's unlikely to have occurred by chance, okay? Um, there's some debate over this, whether it's, it's appropriate, whether there's better means of measuring, but this is a good rule of thumb. Again, it's something that Minitab Excel can give you a p-value so you can see, okay, is this data that I'm sampling indicative of the larger whole? that I'm getting occurring by chance, or is it something that uh, is, is being affected in some way, showing that my data is, is, is off, is not what it used to be? So we, if we want to go back, let me see if I can jump back here to our, our histogram of our wait times. So let's say these are our total wait times. Let's say we take a sample of 30%, and our sample of 30% is falling into categories out here. We run a p-value on that, and we get a p-value of 0 .0001. That's showing us that there's less chance than our accepted probability that those are occurring by chance, so we know that something is happening to increase our wait times. So that's giving us a, an indication that our sample size is not representative of what we think is our normal distribution. So we've actually seen a change, something's different than what was in our, our, our data. Okay. When you're presenting your data, know your audience, make it as simple as possible. What are you showing? Are you showing frequency? Are you showing changes over time? Are you showing how things are related to one another? You want to explain what your problem is, what you're recommending to, to focus on, what changes you're recommending, and, and support it with that data. I mentioned really you want to, you want to get as much as you can into a picture as, as quickly as possible. If you have dashboards, if you want to compare units, compare units side by side. Use charts like this, again, pulling from our, um, our, our annual report. This shows a breakdown of our reports by types, incidents and serious events. We can see very clearly in one picture how many incidents, how many serious events. Again, the Pareto chart, so we, we want to focus on reducing our incidents. We see where that 
that big are our errors from procedures is number one. That's where we want to focus. If we want to look at serious events, where do we focus? Our complications. So this is a, a simple one shot look at where our data is currently. All right, when we're done, what do we do? Did the changes have the effect we want? How long do we have to look at it? We have to continue to collect data. Is, is this something that's part of our normal variation? We need more and more data points to make sure that the change we made, we made is what's resulting in the data shift, okay? How long do you have to require? A lot of times if we do a plan of correction, we're gonna monitor for six months. We're gonna monitor for a year. When does it become quality management? When do we stop? If we have something that's been 100% compliance for three years, do we need to keep measuring that? Probably not. But if we start to see some variation, we can go back and measure it again. We don't want to stop too soon if we make a change. We want to make sure that we can maintain that change. The, the, the rule of thumb is always you're, you're going to see, you know, regression three days, three weeks, three months after. So you at least want to get into that three-month period before you start to make any conclusions of like, okay, what did we did, did what we do have some type of effect here? Um, and, and really, you want to look for stabilization. Once your process is stable, it's in control. You have those upper and lower control limits very, very narrow. Um, you know your process is good and where you want it to be, you can, you can probably stop monitoring. Again, as long as the regulatory agencies say that you're okay to stop monitoring. Our reference is here, and we'll move to question and answer. Thank you, Chris. Just in the interest of time, just um, again, if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to type them in, at, uh, in the Q&A box and direct them to all panelists. Anything we don't get to, we will um, be able to follow up with you individually or send a global response to all uh, those registered. But just maybe time for one question. Chris, how do you determine how many bins or the columns on your histogram and how large they should be? Um, it, it really, use common sense a lot of the times. Um, you know, you'll be able to look at it and say, oh man, I have too many bins or there's too few bins. Uh, but the, the general rule of thumb, at least that I learned and I, I followed pretty good, is, is take your, the square root of your number of data points. So if you have 30 data points and your square root's going to be, what's that, four point something, uh, take that and then, or five point something, take that and then um, 5.4 maybe? I don't do square roots in my head very well, obviously. Uh, take that and then round up. You always want to round up because you don't want to have too few bins to capture everything. So in that case, you would get, let's say, 5.4, you would round up six and you would do six bins. Um, so base it off of your sample size, the number of your, your data points. As far as high as how large, um, again, you want to make sure that they're large enough um, to, to connect all, collect all of your data. So you can take the, the range of your data. So basically, you would take your, your highest value. So if we're talking, you know, commute times, and it, one day it took me 45 minutes to get to work, uh, and then the shortest I was able to get there was 30 minutes, I would subtract that. Um, we would have 15 minutes, uh, and then you would divide that by your number of bins. So if we had five bins, I would divide that by five, I would have three. So my, basically my, my range, the, the, the size of my bins would be three minutes each. Um, so then I would have five bins of, of three minutes each. Okay. All right, thank you. The nice thing, if, you, if you're doing your histogram in Excel, it'll it'll calculate that for you. It'll actually make a, a recommendation for how big, um, how how many bins and how big your bins can be from. Thank you, and this concludes our webinar. <laughs>